you need to be really, really introspective. You need to, um, I know a lot of CEOs that were really happy as the number two at their previous company as a COO or a CFO or whatever, and they're miserable as CEOs. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of, I have hired, <laughs> going back to the previous question, I've hired a number of folks who will tell you they wanna be in startups, who desperately this is the right path for them and they should be working at Bank of America. Um, like th there's, there's a, a very different sort of support structure that comes with a big company Mm. And, uh, and if your mindset is how do I extract value, the greatest value for me from this company, you're gonna have a hard time at start. Everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Journey. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that has built several startups into seven and eight figure businesses, as well as the founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where we help startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. And today we have another fun guest on the episode, Wade Ever, or I was going to say Everly, but it's, how do you pronounce it now? It's, it's Ierly. What's that? It's Ierly, yeah. Ierly. I was going to see Everly, then I'm like, wait, wait a minute, that's a Y, not a B. <laughs> so Wade, Wade Ierly, and Wade uh, has an, a, 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 I'll call it an eclectic, because I don't know what else to call it, background, in the sense that he has done everything from a, first of all, an LDS mission, or a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, whichever you would like to call it, or Mormon, um, in Russia. So we have that in common. I didn't serve in Russia, but I did uh, do an LDS mission as well in Taiwan. So we have that commonality. But in addition to that, he's been a White House staffer, which sounds very interesting to me. And I have no idea if it is interesting, but it sounds interesting. Um, turned uh, Then he was an Intel officer for a period of time. He then started his own airline and uh, dived into all that. And now he's invented a new way, uh, a new type of insurance for the insurance industry. And I won't steal too much of his thunder. He'll get to talk, tell a little bit more about what the new type of uh, insurance is. So more, lots of things to talk about. Great conversation. I'm looking forward to it. And with that, welcome to the podcast, Wade. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to do this. So I gave, or gave kind of a, a brief overview, but maybe, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, starting. He kind of went to Central Missouri State um, for a college. I think you said you were you graduated at 16 in high school, so you're even earlier than that. But maybe give us a few uh, a background, a little bit more on how your journey started, and let's have a great conversation. Yeah, I mean, I was I was a little younger than average, probably when you when you graduate college, and uh, and we moved my senior year, and I graduated at semester. So I I didn't actually know anybody. I didn't have like a counselor or anybody who knew me. I'm the oldest kid. My dad went to eight semesters of open enrollment at the local church school. My mom didn't go to college. And so I didn't, um, I didn't know you were supposed to apply. So I rolled into a college about an hour from my house in August and asked how to shine up, sign up for a dorm. And uh, they're like, you know, it should be in your packet. And I was like, uh, you know, it wasn't in mine, you know, <laughs> 10 minutes later, they're like, did, did you apply? So um, I got no, into I didn't play. How do I apply? I'll go do it right now. Yeah, just tell me what I need to do and I'll do it. Right. And they're like, no, no, buddy. You got to do that in like February, man. So uh, I got into college because a kind hearted registrar took pity on me. And, uh, and so I went to school. Yeah. About an hour from home. I grew up in Independence, Missouri and went to Central Missouri State and got uh, was real lucky to be there. And, and uh, you know, it's paid really good dividends over the course of my life, you know. So you, and so you went to Missouri State, and, what did, and I don't think I asked, what did you graduate in, or what was your major? So I didn't have a major until six months before I graduated, because I'm just that on the ball. And so I, uh, I just took classes I thought were interesting, and, you know, trying to learn a little bit more about the world all the time. And I, I went about two and a half years, and then I went on that mission to Moscow, and then came back. Um, and we didn't have a Russian program, for instance. And so I took some courses from BYU, and I had all these Russian credits, and they didn't know where to park them and what to do with them. And so... Um, <laughs> So I ended up with a double major in international economic policy and in cross-cultural relations. So I took a lot of languages, I took a lot of econ, and they kind of, uh, I, I think they custom built that, both of those majors for me, so. So you, you, so you finally, six months before you graduated, got your major, you decided, okay, I know what I wanna be when I grow up, or you thought you knew what you wanted to be when yeah. you grew up, um, which I also think is funny. I, kudos to you that you were able to maybe you should have been a salesperson that you showed up to college you, had, you didn't even apply and you were able to talk your way in or guilt your way in or find the right person in order to get into college without having to go through the normal application process so I, I think that speaks merits into your sales ability um, 
But with that, you graduated and I think, or what did you do after you graduated? I think you said you went into governmental work for a period of time. Yeah, so I was the first graduate in class after 9-11. So I, I graduated in, in spring of 02, right? And everybody was applying to government work. So I did the same. And I was hired conditional on a security clearance. Uh, and that clearance didn't come through for five and a half years. So I went out to DC. I did, you know, a half dozen different things. I did uh, like media tracking where before the internet, right? Like we would track where you'd shown up in the media and give you your news clips and stuff. I, I, uh, I, did I traveled with the vice president, managed his press on the road there at the White House, went to graduate school and you jumped uh, over a whole bunch out of, at Butte. First, you jumped over too many interesting things, so I'm going to have to jump in and interrupt. One thing I, that All I right. forgot to mention that you mentioned when we talked before the podcast was when you got into government to work, you had to do a 3.0 GPA. Is that right? Yeah. So w- when I was in school, I mean, in order to be hired by the federal government, you had to have a 3.0. And I was a, I was a terrible student. So I had a 257 GPA before I left on my mission. And I'd been just going to school for two and a half years. So I had a ton of credits at 2.5. <laughs> and so in order to get a, you know, a cumulative 3.0, I had to pretty much nail the last year and a half. So, um, but I also candidly just grew up a lot while I was in Russia. And so came back and kind of thought I wanted to go into the government and, and have a career in the foreign service at the time. And so, um, you know, worked my tail off at school, got better grades and, and, you know, kind of barely cleared the hurdle. I think I graduated with like a three, one, five or something. So. Hey, well, Hey, kudos to you to have to say, Hey, I got a year and a half. I got to get this up significantly with all these credits and you figured out how to do it. So again, good work ethic and or smart way to figure it out. So you did that. And, and one of the other things you said, you, you kind of just jumped over at least for, now, we're not going to get into po- talking about politics or which side of the aisle we're on, but you worked, you people could probably get an idea versus, or based on the people that you work for, but you worked uh, uh, on the campaign for a period of time, both with Mitt Romney and Dick Cheney. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So I, I traveled ahead of Dick Cheney and helped manage his press on the road. There's little advanced teams that go out and I was on one of those teams. Uh, and then I was a fundraiser for Mitt for both of his presidential campaigns. So. So is that, now that sounds exciting. Maybe it's completely boring. I have no idea, but you know, at least it's name recognizable people, Mitt Romney and Dick Cheney, certainly whether you're on that side of the aisle or you hate that side of the aisle or anywhere in between, you at least recognize the name. So was it exciting to work on those kind of big campaigns? Was it much more of a boring day-to-day stuff or how does, how does that go? I have no idea what a, a campaign staffer does. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, um, I would say it was an awesome job for a young guy, right? Like I traveled sometimes, 27 days a month, you know, you're, you're just constantly gone and you'd leapfrog ahead of him and get everything squared away. And then he sort of lands in air force two and jumps out of the plane and you brief him in the motorcade and he pops out and looks good. That's the job. And then he takes off on air force two and goes home and you leapfrog to the next location. So, um, you know, you're constantly on the road and it was, I, I mean, if, if I'd done it for Mick Jagger, they would have called me a roadie. So it's not like it's a sexy job. Um, but it, uh, it sure felt cool at the time and you felt like you were doing something important. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I highly recommend if people have those opportunities that they take them, you know? No, I, I, I think it sounds, it, 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 no, I don't think I could, the way you described it, I don't think I could ever do that with my wife and kids and everything. But to your point, if you're a single guy and or a single person and you're wanting to do it, it sounds like a, a fun, a fun job that or has a lot of reward to it. So you did that for a period yeah. of time. And I, and then I think that, if I remember when we talked about while you were doing that or shortly thereafter or whatnot, five years after you applied for your security clearance, it came back and you finally got cleared. Yeah. So I, I then went to, I left that uh, DC in 05 and I went to graduate school at BYU for two years and got a, a degree in public policy. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was sort of, toward, sort of towards the end of that, that they called and said, Hey, good news. Your security clearance is through. Do you still want to, you know, come work in intelligence? And uh I said, yeah, and, and broke up with my Canadian girlfriend and, uh, and moved out to D.C. after I graduated and spent the next, I don't know, two and a half, three years probably, um, you know, working for the government, trying to do good things, make everybody safer. So, and how, and how did that, just as a complete side, how did that conversation go with the Canadian girlfriend? It was like, well, I love you, you're a great girlfriend, but I like <laughs> my job better. How did you break that news to her? I'm taking a job that suggests maybe we're not meant to be together. I don't, I mean, I was probably more callous than I, you know, if I, if I had life to do over again, there's a lot of things I'd do differently. But. But that would maybe be a conversation where you might've, you might've been a little bit or take, done a, take the little bit different tack. Yeah. Fair yeah. enough. 
I just, I was just thinking, I'm like, well, if I was dating somebody who's really serious and I'm like, well, I love you, but I like my job better. So yeah. Yeah. It's, it's it was an awkward conversation to be sure. <laughs> I'm sure it was. So um, good. Or, I, but it sounds like it all worked out in the end. So you did that for a period of time, work, went and uh, hunted down the bad guys. And, uh, and then I think you said that you went to an MBA school in Stanford or how, remind me how you, that all interplayed with things with uh, Stanford. Yeah, so I came back from Iraq in 2010, had a baby two weeks later, and it was time to, you know, do something else for a living. So I, uh, I came out of the field and I started, um, I became an economist at the, at the Pentagon for the J2 and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs covering Europe and NATO as their economies struggled. Um, and as I was looking to transition out of, of government work then, and so I was applying to business schools and the First year I applied to eight schools and they all let me know they were very, very full with actually qualified folks. Uh, and so I reapplied the second year to a handful of them and, uh, and got into school out in California. So the, the plan was to move the family to Palo Alto and, and go do that. And then um, my little brother was a pilot and needed a job. He'd graduated Embry-Riddle. He's you know, sitting on a lot of flight, you know, flight time debt. They, they burn jet fuel in college at Embry-Riddle. And so, um, I said, you know, what's it going to take to keep you in the air? You know, you know what you want to do. You, you've been blessed with that. I never knew that. You know, what's it going to take? And, you know, he's young and flippant. And he goes, I don't know, buy a plane, start an airline. And I was like, okay, I'll look into it and hung up the phone. And, uh, and you know, a couple months later, there we were. I, I had actually the same trip where I interviewed at Stanford. I'd gone down to L.A. and opening a called Mucker Labs. I met with uh, Will Shu and Eric Ranala. And uh, they offered me a spot. And so we ended up starting an airline in January. I moved out to LA. My wife said, look, I'm, uh, w w the family's gonna move once. So you figure out if this airline thing is gonna work. And if it does, we'll move to LA. And if not, we'll meet in Palo Alto. And so I had uh, you know, three, so four months that, to figure it out. And we raised so some money. So was really that just what let you choose? Because I know if I'd have been, first of all, I like how you just said, oh, I got, a, I got it into to a school at, to, in California. And Stanford is, is a fairly well-known, reputable school. So it was, just, it was more than just a, a school in California. But, you know, was it really just that much? All, would you, but you I didn't go. So it's like, you know, like, I don't know how much I get to use that, that brand when I didn't actually go. But yeah, that'd sure, like, it's a great school. That'd be like I'm saying, thrilled. yeah, I got, a, I got into Harvard for Harvard Law, which I didn't. So, you know. But if I say, yeah, I could have gone to Harvard, I decided not. It still speaks volumes to your smart guy that obviously got into a good school. So I give you at least a point or a couple points for getting into Stanford. So how did you make that? Because now I'll ask I'll take question. it. I'll, I'll, I'll. <laughs> well, so I want to give you one little anecdote. When I called my dad to tell him, hmm. I'm like, hey, I got into Stanford Business School, right? And he's all excited for me. And then a minute later, he says, so which one? Like, what do you mean? He's like, well, there's a Stanford, Connecticut, and there's a Stanford, Kentucky. And I'm like, no, dad, Stanford with an N in Palo Alto. I'm like, does it, does it seem like a bigger deal now? And he's like, well, I was just excited for you wherever you're going to go. I knew it was something you wanted to do. Like, I know, completely nonplussed. Stanford, like, the one that everybody knows that you see on TV, that's Stanford. So. That's the one, yeah. Um, he just never put much stock in brand and, and was like, he said, he was going to be happy for me wherever I went. So the closest I ever got to Stanford was I worked for a law firm that was in Palo Alto. So I used, I always run in the morning. So I went and ran up to the Stanford campus. So I've been to Stanford, but they yeah. never, they never said I could go to school there. So, but well, with a beautiful that, spot. And <laughs> so with that almost, you know, so you got Stanford, which is a great MBA school, certainly well written neck rate ranked and has name recognition or he got this hey my brother said he needed five planes i'll start a, a startup business and or start an airline how did you make that decision or how did you weigh those against each other so i wanted to start a business when i was leaving the government and uh you know w once you form a family you start doing things together you get to make better decisions because there's a check on your you know it, it i'm very very risk tolerant Mm. And so um, there's, there's a nice check that makes sure I don't take crazy risks. And one of the things she said is, uh, you know, I, I think you'll be better at it if you go to business school first, right? Mm. Now, get some training. I don't think I took two business classes in my undergrad, right? Like I just, it wasn't my world. And so, um, so I thought, you know, she's right. So I've applied to all these business schools and that's what we were doing. And then when the incubator accepted us, she said, okay, well, like, give it a shot. And I, I kind of convinced her that the rounding error on the debt, I mean, if you're going to take out a quarter million dollars to go to business school, 
like three extra months of no income or five extra months of no income was sort of a rounding error on the whole thing. So I could try it in January. If it didn't work in July or August, you know, we're up in Palo Alto. And so that was kind of what we did was like, oh, we'll give it a shot. And then in May or June, we, you know, we raised four and a quarter, I think, a uh, million dollars. And so we were off to the races and family like moved out to LA, Santa Monica with us. And, uh, you know, and I ran that company for two years and then we brought in another um, CEO to run it. And I was essentially not useful anymore because um, there's somebody else running it day to day. And so I, I think of it a lot like that business school experience, you know, except that I got paid to run a company for two years and instead of paying somebody else to learn it. But uh, it had to be a lot of the same lessons you would learn in business school. And I went, I've done both. So I'll give you the insight. And I, I think that the boots up, so I did, I, I can't remember if we mentioned this before, but so I ended up getting four degrees when I was doing all the studying. So I did an in, or electrical engineering, Chinese, an MBA and a law degree. And I, I did those both all in parallel. So I did the undergraduate, wow. I did two degrees, and then I did law and MBA at the same time. And I would say your education is, as far as I think there are merits to both, but to get boot or to get the best training, you're going to have to dive in and just learn it no matter what. MBA school is much more if you wanted to come in and help a business to grow, explore new channels and everything else. But I don't know that it really prepared you as well as maybe they could have for startups. So I, I give you, I think that you made the right decision for whatever that or whatever that's worth. Well, I, I've certainly been happy with the path. That said, it is a little like breaking up with the girl you still love. So I, uh, th there's, there's an element of me that still wishes I was, you know, walking around with a sweatshirt with trees on it. But um, <laughs> they were, to, to their credit, when I, I came to them and said, hey, I wanted to defer because we just raised this money. And, uh, you know, in the admissions office there, she said, look, like, we don't really do that. We can't do that. But honestly, like, you just raised $4 million for an airline. Why don't you just come back and teach someday? <laughs> and I, I reflect, I've reflected on that a lot later because it was the classiest, like, she made me feel good about the fact that I was walking away from this thing I'd clearly put a lot into mm. and, uh, and sort of validated me. Like, it was just like the, the best possible way to handle it because it was hard to let that go. Mm. And yeah, so that's, I, an, awesome, I, so, that's an awesome answer. I'm, I'm impressed that they would, they would have the wherewithal to say, Hey, you should probably, you've already done better where we can teach you go chase your dream. You've already done a great job. So that's awesome. Yeah. It, all it did was make me more impressed with Stanford. So, <laughs> <laughs> which also makes it all the harder to, to look back and say, I didn't do it. So, so you did sure. that. And I think you said you started in one airline, you were running it for a while and then you did, or you, you, grew it and then you step back somebody else took over and didn't you say you did a second airline that wasn't as successful or that you screwed up yeah so we we launched another one uh similar model different operating models but similar customer models. so we invented subscription flying two grand a month all you can fly and uh so we went out to new york and launched that and we made a couple bad decisions and killed that frankly like we we did it wrong the the market works and the model works and we screwed it up uh, and so as I was shopping those assets sort of with my tail between my legs, uh, I, uh, I ran into a guy, Kenny Dichter, who runs Wheels Up, which is a billion dollar aviation startup. And he's been, he was the founder of Marquee Jet, invented jet cars, became vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, just like a, a storied guy. Hmm. And, uh, and he very flatteringly said, look, the asset we would want here is you. What will it take? And, uh, and so I said, give me a month to put my employees in jobs and then I'll give you a call. And, uh, and so I ended up there. Uh, as MD of new ventures, new products, new markets, government affairs, m a just sort of everything you do that isn't the core business uh, was sort of put into a bucket and th that I could go run with. Uh, and then after a year or two there, as I began preparing to IPO, those are all the things you also stop doing as you, as you prep for an IPO because it's all about hitting consistent numbers now. And so that's when I rolled off and began to build this insurance company. But I, I got to spend another year and a half or two um, mm -hmm sort of studying under some really successful aviation folks, which was also great. No, that's, that's awesome. So, and, and kudos to you, because I've got to imagine everything I've ever read and listened to is the aviation industry is incredibly hard to get in there and to be successful because a lot of times it's, you know, low margins and you're, you're very, very dominant on whether, what the fuel prices are and, and everything else. And I think I'll give it to kudos to you. Since you said Mitt Romney and Dick Cheney, I'm guessing I know which side of the aisle you're on, but I think Donald Trump tried to start an airline industry and also failed, didn't he? 
Uh, I think I think Trump airline was a thing for a hot minute and didn't really make it. There's a lot that didn't really make it for sure. That's true. But I was going to say you did better than Trump on airlines. So I was going to give you kudos. So so you did that. And now you're going to say I've got an idea. So how did you come up with the idea? Or how did you get into insurance? Because it seems like it's a different industry, a different market and, and something yeah. new to jump into. So I'm not a big believer in the value of related experience generally. So um, I think it's easier to learn a new industry than people give, give credit. But I do think the, um, so I, I really believe in innovating in heavily regulated space. So there's a startling amount of innovating in airlines that actually plays in, in insurance. Uh, but what happened was one of my pilots was moving boxes and hurt his back and ultimately had to begin taking pain meds to sit in a chair for eight hours a day. Uh, and in most jobs, you can, you know, have a standing desk or get up and walk to the water cooler or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, but pilot's the rare job where you have to sit in a chair for eight hours a day. Like, there's just no alternative. And so he, he ultimately lost his career over a total fluke, you know. And I remember describing it to another co-founder as, uh, you know, when you run a start, like, you just love everybody there. It's family, you know. Mm -hmm. And how tragic it was that he'd made this investment, right? He's probably sitting on a quarter million dollars in debt again from Embry Riddle or wherever he learned to fly, right? And, uh, and it just wasn't going to pay off for him. And it was that framing that helped me see that higher education is essentially the largest uninsured investment market in the world, hmm. right? You, you borrow five, 10, 20 times your net worth. You're 18 years old. It's the first legal contract you can sign. Hmm. Um, and, you, and everybody tells you to borrow as much as you can, you can right? Hmm. And you borrow it from the mob. Uh, what, what's not mob money, but it's... <laughs> completely non-dischargeable right like you can't get oh, out yeah. of it. you can clear bankruptcy to, you're to rip off dave there. ramsey he always calls it the kgb because you can never it, it never leaves you alone and follows you forever yeah you can't get out of it and so it's kind of dead 18 right and then and you you make this investment and then you just hope it works right like mm -hmm. 10 times on stock and just like hope it's gonna be okay and because higher ed works so it works really really well but if it happens to not work for you right you you anchor your market rate at a low point right you graduate into a down economy there's not much you can do for it's gonna take you 21 years on average to pay back your student loans like that's a generation your kids say mom or dad can you I end my loans um it, and, and you end up sort of not able to get out from under them. It just didn't work for you. And the wealthy effectively have always self-insured. So if you go to undergrad and you graduate in the wrong year and it doesn't work for you, mm -hmm. you, uh, you, you double down, right? If, if nine out of 10 times it works, then you just spin that wheel again. So mm -hmm. they, they go to law school, business school, right? They, they hide from the economy in a socially acceptable way for two or three years mm -hmm. and, uh, and try to emerge at a different point. But if you're a first generation student, first generation American, you know, underrepresented minority, otherwise poor, right? You, you don't have that option. You got to go to work now. You, you put everything in, you got to college, you did it all right. It's not your fault. You graduate, but it just kind of doesn't yeah, or, pay off. Or so, even, even if you come from a, de a decently well-do family, you get married, you have kids, you have responsibilities. And yeah. even if you're doing well, it can be one where, you know, the, it can, it can crash in, in a second. So I like it the way you put it. Absolutely. Yeah, so we, we, uh, we said, all right, if it's an uninsured investment market, then we should be able to build a hedge for it, an insurance on it that says if it doesn't work for you, we're going to catch you up and make you whole. The same way that, you know, we, we've all got homeowners insurance and uh, we hope we never have to use it. I hope my home never burns down. But yeah. the one t guy you once knew who one time had their home burned down, you're sure glad they got to rebuild it, right? And it's the same thing here. College is going to work for most everybody almost all the time. Mm. But in the event that it didn't work for, you know, your buddy James, gosh, wouldn't it be nice that he can reset and he doesn't have to be made destitute because he went to college, right? And so we, we offer that chance to reset. So our, our product, you sort of a college buys it on behalf of the students, sort of, on, so they buy it for the incoming freshman class. And then those kids go to school for three to six years, graduate. And we, we basically say, hey, we'll, be, we'll guarantee that you're business majors can make 42 grand a year or your engineers will make 56 or your dance majors will make 31 or whatever the breakdown of prices is for that, for the various majors at that school. And then you, so you've got new insight into like changing your major and what impact it has. And then you graduate for five years, you send us your tax returns. Hmm. And if you didn't earn over that period, what we said you would, we cut you a check for the difference, right? Like we'll, we'll make you whole. 
And you can use that to go to grad school now. You could use that to pay off the loans. You it for whatever you want. Maybe you've paid them off because you just worked your tail off, but it, you know, mm. wasn't what you thought it would be. And we're able to like give you that 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 safety net. So that's that's really what we've built. And in August, we were licensed in Illinois. That's the first state to approve us as an insurance product. Mm. Um, that process takes more than you think, right? Insurance is regulated by each of the 50 states separately. Uh, there, there's not really a federal regulator for insurance. And so um, we can now sell it in Illinois for the first time. And we spent the last 30 days trying to do that, knock, cold, knocking on doors for university presidents saying, hey, this, this is something you want to be able to tell your students, right? That you can guarantee their futures. And so how, just out of curiosity, so how has it, has it been well received? People love it. Do you have the educational system that, you know, is slow to evolve and they don't want to invest or try out something new? Or how has it gone so far since you guys have launched? Yeah, I mean, I, I, people are really intrigued. People sort of like it in concept. And there's a question of how you pay for it. And there's also a question of sort of mental bandwidth as we're in the middle of all the COVID response stuff right now. Um, schools aren't good at doing lots of new things at once, right? The, the risk tolerance is generally pretty low, uh, but you do have some really great innovators out there that are, that are trying things and willing to. But they're in the middle of trying to make sure they've got liability waivers that they don't get sued if somebody gets COVID when they're on campus. And they, I mean, they have a hundred other challenges they've never expected before. Mm. And so even though we address something critical to them right now, which is, you know, students aren't enrolling at mm. the same numbers. And so they're, they're, their revenues are down and they're, they're trying to cut their way to success, which is not a good plan. Um, and we can help buoy up that revenue stream. The, uh, the mental bandwidth sometimes just isn't there right now. Like they just can't process one more new thing. So we do hear, you know, come back in January, like, love it. Like, it sounds amazing. Come talk to me, you know, in the new year when we've been through a semester and kind of like got our sea legs under us. No, I think that probably to them is fair. And it makes sense that yeah. they're trying to figure things out. One of the interesting things, just as an aside, but I think that they're also dealing with is, you know, they're getting, it's interesting. I think it was Stanford. I'd have to go look now. So don't, don't, don't quote me on it, even though I'm, I'm saying it on the podcast, but they are also getting sued because they're getting students that were paying for a live and in-person in experience. And then they're saying, now you get to stay at home. You don't get to go out. They don't have any experience. You don't get the live thing. And so p students would come back saying, I, why am I paying the same, same price for what would be an inferior product? And so I think they're also dealing with that as a balance of how to deal yeah. with that as well. Yeah, no, they're, they're dealing with a lot of just newness, right? Like it's all new and, and there's a whole bunch of things like, it, is it the same product? You know, is, is college about knowledge delivery or is it about the experience and going out with your buddies and joining a for Like, you know, what is that? How do you define that college experience? Like they, they're dealing with a lot right now. No, uh, no question. And I think um, the, the, their biggest problem now you've, and I drug myself off to an aside. The interesting thing is their problem is, is they've been preaching for so long that online experience is not as good as in person, trying to compete with all the online schools. But now to come back saying, eh, never mind. We're it, online just as good as in person. They've kind of dug themselves a bit of a hole. So it's interesting to see how that plays out as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I, and I think that now going back to your story, I think that that's an interest. I like that I, it at least makes sense, a common thread between the airline industry and the insurance industry. Cause I, I agree that that seems like very highly regulated. I've looked at it. I've had to deal with it from the legal side before. And it's, it's always a pain in the butt in the sense that they always are, there's a lot of hoops to jump through, but it makes for a good barrier to entry. If you actually jump through all the hoops, you can make it so it's harder for someone to just knock you off or copy what you're doing. So one of the interesting things about heavily regulated space, I have this theory I call the iron balloon, like, like big companies are a balloon that don't want to be popped. And so they use regulation, they use their market power to sort of build this iron bulwark around it to keep people from popping them. Um, but what it means is if you'll fight through the little blowhole, you've got nothing but growth in front of you. And so you look at the most successful startups in the country every year, mm. they're often in very, very heavily regulated space because that's where the opportunity is greatest. And to your point, You've got this protective barrier around you now. Um, good, bad, or otherwise, it exists. It existed for someone else, but now you're there. The other one that I like is, you know, I, I tend to think I'm like a decently smart human, but I'm by no means the smartest guy running around. Mm. And uh, you don't have to outsmart everybody. In heavily regulated space, you can outwork everybody. And, and that's a rare dynamic. So uh, when you want to start an airline, there's a path to do that, a known path with the FAA. Like, so I walked into an FAA office and said, how do I start an airline? And they kind of verbally pat you on the head and say, well, it's really hard. And you go, okay, all right. But what's the path? Like, right. oh, well, you'd have to fill out this form and you send it to these 12 offices and you do these things, you know, you got to file this and then you got to hire these three. People. Like, okay, so can I photocopy this one, have this one, or how do I, you know, how do I get the form? And 
So as long as you're just willing to do it, mm. you don't have to think of the system. It's the only way to start a startup that where there's a playbook already there. No, right? that, that's a, that's a, I like that as it's a good insight in the sense that it gives you a competitive advantage. Not the always now you don't have to be the smartest innovator or the person that has all the answers. You just have to make it through all the bureaucracy and all the regulations and you beat out most of the people that will never go through all of that. Yeah. If you have patience and you're willing to just put your nose down and do the stuff, right. And a lot of it's busy work and shouldn't apply. And, you know, and like, okay. And you beat your head against a hundred walls, but like, if you can do that, then heavily regulated space is a great place to innovate, right? Like I, I've never almost, done anything in medicine or pharmaceuticals, but I, you know, I'd you, almost do that you, even in the legal industry, which I'm in. And I, I look at basically, basically law school. I've had to take two different bar exams because I have to take both the normal bar exam to be licensed in Utah. And I also have to take the special little patent bar exam in order to be a patent attorney. And do I think that that gives me, it doesn't prove that I'm going to be a good attorney. Now I hope I'm a good attorney and I think I am, but it does create the barriers to entry that if you go through enough of that, almost what you're saying regulation, then you can say it, it limits the field as the number of people that are in there and it gives you a competitive advantage. And then not only yeah. that, I, you know, almost like what you did, I kind of like said, now I'm in this industry. It's, a, it's one that's already limited. How do I shake up this industry? How do I do something different? And that's how, where I've started to implement a lot of our program. So without jumping yeah. Yeah, it's great. So now we've, and we've diverted into a few fun tangents and I've enjoyed every minute of it. We are reaching towards the end of the podcast. So I'm going to jump to the questions I always ask at the end of the podcast. So the first question I'll ask is what was the worst business decision you ever made and what did you learn from it? Worst business decision I've ever made. So um, any executive that, that doesn't tell you it's a hiring decision is lying to themselves, right? Like you've got an error rate and uh, a bad employee or someone who's not bought in on the vision and contributing the way that like they drag down the whole team. Hmm. So, um, and, and then the hard part is because you hired them cause you like them, right? You love them. Like you, and you, you build this affinity for people. And so it's very hard to move on from those folks sometimes too, even though you know their performance isn't what it should be. Hmm. Um, so I, I mean the, the greatest sort of failures are usually hiring the wrong person and waiting too long to help them find some place where they will be happy when they're not happy there. Um, and and oh, everybody makes that mistake, but I certainly made that mistake as well. And and I'm I'm right there with you. And the, and I, I always found that it's even beyond talent. You can find a lot of talented people, but your problem is you also, as you mentioned, they have to buy into the vision. They have to, and you know all the cliche words, but they really hold meaning. Is they have to be on board for how where you want to bring the take the company. Otherwise, they're always pulling it in a different direction, or they're always trying to you know pull things back, or they're not really all on board. And so I think hiring is one lesson that no matter how many books you read, no matter how many other people you see do it, and no matter how many great bosses you've been under until you're actually in that position of hiring, it's one where you just, one thing you just have to work out. So I think that that's a great, great point. Yeah. So second question now, if you were talking to someone that's just getting into startups or small businesses, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give them? The one piece of advice, you need to be really, really introspective. You need to, um, I know a lot of CEOs that were really happy as the number two at their previous company as a COO or a CFO or whatever, and they're miserable as CEOs. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of, I have hired, going back to the previous question, I've hired a number of folks who will tell you they want to be in startups, who desperately, this is the right path for them, and they should be working at Bank of America. Um, like, there's, there's a, a very different sort of support structure that comes with a big company Mm. And, uh, and if your mindset is how do I extract value, the greatest value for me from this company, you're gonna have a hard time at a startup. Or if it's like, this is what I do. I'm, I'm a finance guy. This is what I do. Why am I in the marketing meeting? You're gonna have a hard time at a startup. Mm. Right. Uh, and, and there are, there are folks who they, they believe it, they want it their whole life. They think startup is the answer for them. And they would just be so happy in a big company. So mm. I think you need to be really, really introspective about what you want and why you want the startup. Um, often you want to make great outsized impact when you're in a junior role mm -hmm. and a startup will afford you that, but it also affords you then outsized responsibility mm -hmm. and so you have gr the greater chance of blowing it up in your face too. Right. And so, um, so it, it's, it, it's different, right. And your, your risk tolerance and your stress tolerance, and you know, you kind of got to know who you are. And frankly, earlier in your career, you might not know who you are yet and, and what would be best for you. And so er in those early years, you really should be trying to figure out where you're going to fit best, where your skill set works, where your personality works. 
Um, I, I spent the early part of my career in the government and I could have had a nice government career. I, you know, was promoted at a good rate and I, you know, I had, I had a good path there, but I also knew that I was going to be miserable. Uh, and I didn't know that going in. I, th I went to undergrad believing I was going to be a foreign service officer. Right. And that's mm. sort of what I wanted to do. And, uh, and I got into the government and it was, it was evident really quick. I, uh, there are wonderful people doing really, really good work there, mm. but there's a different mindset around like, well, my job is to sort of see what I can get out of the government, right? Can I go to this one more conference or get this one more training or find this bonus over here? Or like, what can I do to maximize me? Mm. Not, and, and there's not a, a strong sort of customer orientation, right? And I, and I knew that I wanted something different. So I, I knew quickly it was going to be a job and not a career for me, but I did not know that going in, right? And, and no. startups can be the same, right? People should, should look at that hard. But on the flip side, if you really are that person, then do it now. Right. There's nothing that will qualify you to do it. That, there's not like I need three years at a management consultant and then I'll go build one. Like you should just do it now. No, and I agree. And I think that's that's valid points on both. And sometimes sometimes it's also better to do it, go out, try it, find out you it's not for you, and then go back and be much happier at the job you're at. Cause you know, there's a lot of people I could do it so much better than my boss. And then they actually go and try and start it and I'm like, you mean I have to do payroll? I have to do taxes. I have to do HR. I have to do hiring and firing. I have to do product development. I have to do marketing. I have to work 20 hours and it, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the list goes on and on. And you find, find saying, well, I thought I wanted to start up. Now I'm going to go back and do the career. And there's so much happier. So sometimes I think it also is just trying it out, getting it out of your system. And if it works out great, awesome. And if it doesn't, then fall back on what you can do well. You know, my, my little brother was my co-founder at Surf Air. And uh, my whole life, he wanted to be an entrepreneur. And that was like, we all knew that the day David wanted to be an entrepreneur. And uh, as I was the CEO and we're building the company, he said to me once, he's like, I thought I wanted to be an entrepreneur because I wanted to be in control of my own destiny. I didn't want to have somebody tell me what to do. And he said, I have never seen someone with less control of what they do than you. It's like you're building a jigsaw puzzle out of a tornado, right? And like trying to pull down a piece and put it in constantly. And it's the opposite of what I thought the experience would be. There's, there's less control here, not more. Yeah. And, uh, and so he learned, like, I think that's not for me, right? Maybe I could do a, we, we talked about it. He's like, maybe I could do like a, a franchise where here's the rules and I can go execute and I can do that really well, right? But he's a pilot for a good reason, right? It's a checklist uh, and, job. Use the pilot analogy. I always say, you know, and I always laugh because we're doing the same thing and I'm in legal industry, but we're trying a whole bunch of new programs, trying to mix it up. And it, I always say, I'm, I'm building the airplane as it's taking off. Maybe I've, yeah. I don't even have the airplane built. And I'm trying to get it to fly. And hopefully it takes off before we get to the end of the runway because you're trying to get everything done and trying to or juggle it all. And I think there's absolutely a ton of, thing, ton of uh, truth to that you're, there isn't as much control as you think of the CEO. And usually there's a lot less. But we could yeah. go on all day and maybe sometime again we'll have to. But for today... So people want to reach out. They want to find out more about your insurance company. If they're in the getting ready to go to school, they're in school. They want to know how to ensure their career. They want to make sure that they make as much as they possibly can and not, and not be worried about graduating. Best way to reach out to you. Uh, degreeinsurance.co, right? Just come to the website and, and uh, you know, reach out to us. Our, our emails are there. Everybody's easy to find, but uh, we'd love to talk to anybody who's interested. Awesome. Well, I encourage everybody from if you're in the educational industry to if you're a student and anybody in between, or if you just want to find out more about a very uh, fun career and, all, and how, to, how you made all your decisions to reach out to you. Now, for all of those, all of you that are uh, listeners, if you have a great journey to tell, we'd love to have you on. Feel free to go to inventivejourneyguest.com. Apply to be a guest on the podcast. We'd love to hear your, episode, or hear your journey. If you make sure to click subscribe so you get notifications as all of these awesome episodes come out. And lastly, if you ever need help with patents and trademarks, feel free to reach out to us at Miller IP Law. We're always here to help. Thank you again, Wade. It's been fun. It's been a pleasure. And I wish we always had more time and we'll have to have you back on soon. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it.
or if it's like, this is what I do. I'm, I'm a finance guy. This is what I do. Why am I in the marketing meeting? You're going to have a hard time at a startup. Mm. Right. And, and there are, there are folks who they, they believe they want it their whole life. They think startup is the answer for them and they would just be so happy in a big company. So mm. I think you need to be really, really introspective about what you want and why you want the startup. Um, often you want to make great outsized impact when you're in a junior role mm. and a startup will afford you that, but it also affords you then outsized responsibility. Mm. And so you have the greater chance of blowing it up in your face too. Right. And so, um, so it, it's, it's different, right? And your, your risk tolerance and your stress tolerance and you, know, you kind of got to know who you are. And frankly, earlier in your career, you might not know who you are yet and, and what would be best for you. And so er, in those early years, you really should be trying to figure out where you're going to fit best, where your skill set works, but where your personality works. Um, I, I spent the early part of my career in the government and I could have had a nice government career. I, you know, was promoted at a good rate and I, you know, I had, I had a good path there. But I also knew that I was going to be miserable. Uh, and I didn't know that going in. I, th I went to undergrad believing I was going to be a foreign service officer, right? And that's mm. sort of what I wanted to do. And, uh, and I got into the government and it was, it was evident really quick. I, uh, there are wonderful people doing really, really good work there. Mm. But there's a different mindset around like, well, my job is to sort of see what I can get out of the government, right? Can I go to this one more conference or get this one more training or find this bonus over here like what can i do to maximize me mm. not and, and there's not a, a strong sort of customer orientation right and I, and I knew that i wanted something different so i i knew quickly it was going to be a job and not a career for me but i did not know that going in right and, and no, startups can be the same right people should should look at that hard but on the flip side if you really are that person then do it now right there's nothing that will qualify you to do it that there's not like i need three years at a management consultant and then i'll go build one like you should just do it now. No, and I agree. And I think that's, that's valid points on both. And sometimes, sometimes it's also better to do it, go out, try it, find out you, it's not for you and then go back and be much happier at the job you're at. Cause you know, there's a lot of people, I could do it so much better than my boss. And then they actually go and try and start it. And I'm like, you mean I have to do payroll? I have to do taxes. I have to do HR. I have to do hiring and firing. I have to do product development. I have to do marketing. I have to work 20 hours and it, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the list goes on and on. And you find, find saying, well, I thought I wanted to start up. Now I'm going to go back and do the career. And they're so much happier. So sometimes I think it also is just trying it out, getting it out of your system. And if it works out great, awesome. And if it doesn't, then fall back on what you can do well. You know, my, my little brother was my co-founder at Surf Air. And uh, my whole life, he wanted to be an entrepreneur. And that was like, we all knew that the day David wanted to be an entrepreneur. And uh, as I was the CEO and we're building the company, he said to me once, he's like, I thought I wanted to be an entrepreneur because I wanted to be in control of my own destiny. I didn't want to have somebody tell me what to do. And he said, I have never seen someone with less control of what they do than you. It's like you're building a jigsaw puzzle out of a tornado, right? And like trying to pull down a piece and put it in constantly. And it's the opposite of what I thought the experience would be. There's, there's less control here, not more. Yeah. And, uh, and so he learned like, I think that's not for me, right? Maybe I could do a, we, we talked about it. He's like, maybe I could do like a, a franchise where here's the rules and I can go execute and I can do that really well, right? But he's a pilot for a good reason, right? It's a checklist uh, and, job. Use a pilot analogy. I always say, you know, and I always laugh because we're doing the same thing and I'm in legal industry, but we're trying a whole bunch of new programs, trying to mix it up. And it, I always say, I'm, I'm building the airplane as it's taking off. Maybe I'm, yeah. I don't even have the airplane built and I'm trying to get it to fly and hopefully it takes off before we get to the end of the runway because you're trying to get everything done and trying to or juggle it all. And I think there's absolutely a ton of, thing, ton of uh, truth to that you're, there isn't as much control as you think as a CEO and usually there's a lot less. But we could yeah. go on all day and maybe sometime again we'll have to, but for today, so people want to reach out, they want to find out more about your insurance company. If they're in the getting ready to go to school, they're in school, they want to know how to ensure their career, they want to make sure that they make as much as they possibly can and not, and not be worried about graduating, best way to reach out to you? Uh, degreeinsurance.co, right? Just come to the website and, and uh, you know, reach out to us. Our, our emails are there, everybody's easy to find, but uh, we'd love to talk to anybody who's interested. Awesome. Well, I encourage everybody from if you're in the educational industry to if you're a student and anybody in between, or if you just want to find out more about a very uh, fun career and, all, and how, to, how you made all your decisions to reach out to you. Now, for all of those, all of you that are uh, listeners, if you have a great journey to tell, we'd love to have you on. Feel free to go to inventivejourneyguest.com. Apply to be a guest on the podcast. We'd love to hear your, episode, or hear your journey. 
you make sure to click subscribe so you get notifications as all of these awesome episodes come out. And lastly, if you ever need help with patents and trademarks, feel free to reach out to us at Miller IP Law. We're always here to help. Thank you again, Wade. It's been fun. It's been a pleasure. And I wish we always had more time and we'll have to have you back on soon. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it.